we're just one big family here. This is an incredible church. Isn't it exciting to be a part of a life-giving, exciting church? Isn't that awesome? I love being a part of this and love visiting. You guys are phenomenal. I have a message I'm going to jump right into, and the title of the message is, It's Time to Dream Again. It's time to dream again. And right before I jump in, Ronnie mentioned I do, I do have a family. I'm married. I have four kids. We have a 14-year-old daughter, a 12-year-old son, an 8-year-old son, and a 4-year-old daughter. And life is crazy. Anybody in here have four or more kids? <clears throat> We get each other. Okay, so it's insane, but it is awesome. And um, I'm the uh, lead associate pastor of the church. My dad has been the pastor there, gosh, for, is it 30-something years? I always forget. I mean, it's all these numbers every, all the time. 35 years at the church, and it's been the honor of my life to work for him. And um, those those old Woodwards, those you know, those old Woodwards, they're, they're good guys, aren't they? I mean, you know, you were saying that you're older than me, and I was like, much, much. Um <laughs> I, I love you more, Ronnie. Um, so it's time to dream again. It's time to dream again. You know, there's a difference between a good dream in our lives and a God dream. Would you guys agree? A good dream is something we choose, and a God dream is something that chooses us. And um, this whole message is going to be a message about purpose. And one of my biggest passions in life is bring, trying to bring the Bible to life and show people that you have genuine purpose in life, and there's purpose so much greater than just showing up to church, checking a box, and leaving. Showing up to work, checking a box, and leaving. And we've compartmentalized our lives so much that at the end of our days and the end of our weeks, we're looking back and all of a sudden it's at the end of years, looking over our shoulder, asking the question, what is all of this about? And very few people ever get to really tap into the reason they were born, the reason they were created, and that's what I want to talk about today. So I'm just going to ask right off the bat, just for you to think in your mind, what is the reason God took the time to create you? Is it for more than what you're doing now? Is it for more than living in this whirlwind of a life that, that's dictating your schedule and your money and you feel like a pinball in a pinball machine? Is it more than this? Is it more than what you're doing? Have you really tapped into the reason that the God of the universe stopped, took the time to think you into existence, to speak you into existence for right now, for such a time as this? But those are the most important questions for us to ask, or we live very mundane lives of routine, and we end up very, very, very unhappy. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to be camped out mostly there, and we're going to talk about the story of Joseph. And when someone's preaching on a dream, they preach the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. And um, just to catch you up on what's happening, Joseph is the son of Jacob, or known as Israel, and Joseph is the son of Jacob's favorite wife, because there was a, that's a whole other sermon and different story. But Joseph was the son of Rachel. Joseph has 10 older brothers, eventually has a younger brother named Benjamin. But Joseph is the favorite of his father, Jacob. Jacob gives him a coat of many colors. He's running around. Any of you guys have another sibling that's not you that was the favorite in your house? It, it was different seasons, but for a long season, my middle brother, Jonathan, was the favorite, and it was very obvious because he got to do whatever he, he wanted. I remember coming back from college and visiting one time, and I told him, asked my parents, I was like, where's Jonathan? They're like, oh, he's in Cabo San Lucas for spring break with his friends. I'm like, mom, he's 17 years old. They're like, we know, but he's perfect, so we let him go. And I'm like, are you kidding me? My parents wouldn't let me go to my friend's house, and they're letting Jonathan go to Cabo San Lucas. I mean, I, I, you, we've all been there, right? You have another sibling that seems like the favorite. It, this is that times a hundred. Jacob didn't even try to hide it. At least some parents try to hide it. Like, no, they're not our favorite. Like, yeah, they're our favorite, you know, kind of thing. But he didn't even try to hide it. Coat of many colors. It was a sign of favoritism. And Joseph's running around. He's that annoying little sibling that loves the fact that he's the favorite. But there is a deep hatred that begins to rise in his brothers toward him. And then one day, Joseph has this dream, a God-given dream about the future. And we're going to go through five things, uh, five ways we can know that if your dream is a, the difference between a good dream and a God dream. Is your dream for your life a God dream? If it's a God dream, number one, your dream will be God-sized. Everybody say God-sized. So Genesis chapter 37, verses 5 through 7, um, and then I'm going to jump also down to verse 9, says this. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, 
Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. This is, this is looking real good, right? Um, verse nine. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when you read the story in context, what you're finding is that he's basically telling them, this dream symbolizes us. And I had a dream that one day all of you are going to come to me and bow down. And not just you, because in the second dream, the sun, moon, and the stars, the sun is Jacob, the moon is his mother, and the stars are them, are all going to bow down to me. So not only is this young little punk brother running around with a coat of many colors, but now he's saying, not only am I the favorite, but now I'm God's favorite. Because he gave me a dream that said, all of you are going to bow down to me. So this hatred and bitterness that's rising up <clears throat> is starting to rise up even more. But one of the marks of a God dream, though, and the point I want to pull from this passage I just read, is that it's God-sized. A God dream has to be God-sized. And a God dream is something that you cannot attain on your own. I was the youth pastor at our church for about nine years, and this was always a question I would ask teenagers. What's your purpose? What's your destiny? Why did God take the time to create you? What's your dream? What's your calling? And if they ever responded with something that they could do in their own power, I would say that's a good dream, but it's not a God dream. Because God never gives us a purpose that we can fulfill on our own because it's not his purpose. He has to get glory from it. And if he doesn't step in and do the impossible in our lives, then it wasn't a God dream and he doesn't give, get the glory. So what he tells us about a God dream is you do what's possible, I'll do what's impossible. But what we do is we find ourselves retreating and we have all of these excuses when we look at us about our lives, our calling. It could be age, it could be money, it could be talent, all of these different things. And God's looking at us and we're looking at him and we have this idea of what we're supposed to do in our lives, but we've retreated from the impossible because we really, at the end of the day, get insecure and want to do it ourselves because we don't believe God could use someone like me. But that's who he wants to use the people that feel the most inadequate because he can get the most glory out of it. So he wants us to do what's possible. He'll do the impossible. So what's your dream? What has God put in your heart? What's your purpose? I remember when I was 16 years old, the first time I ever really remember having a God dream, I was at a summer camp. And so you, they were just advertising camp up here. If you have a teenager, get them to camp. There is something about pulling away from normal life and going with an expectant heart as a teenager to receive from God. My greatest God moments were at camps. And I was 16 years old and I responded to an altar call. And it was just right up at the front on this side of, a, you know, those old camp, like tap. Why at camps do they always call it a tabernacle? You ever know that? Like nowhere else, but at a youth camp, the, the, the building's called a tabernacle. You're like tabernacle, what does that even mean? So I'm at the front and I responded to this altar. It wasn't even about calling. I don't even know what it was about. I might have just been responding to look godly in front of a girl I had a crush on or something. Seriously, at 16, you're not really caring about that stuff. But I came and I started praying and just said, God, I'm up here. What do you, what do you want to show me? And it was like a ton of bricks hit me in that moment. And I wasn't even expecting it, but I just opened up my heart a little bit and said, God, what do you want? And this rush of a dream came in my heart of reaching not just hundreds of teenagers, but thousands of teenagers, getting into the schools in Albuquerque, which had shut the church out and seeing lives transformed. And, you know, and every 16 year old that has a call from God sees themselves speaking in a stadium. I don't know what it is about stadiums. You know what I mean? Like everybody that gets called to ministry, I saw myself preaching in a stadium. It is what it is, but you know, that probably will never happen. But I had this massive God dream. And I remember standing up 16 years old thinking that was just me because all of that is absolutely impossible. And I had a camp counselor that year. I don't even remember his name. He was from another church and was assigned to our bunk. And I told him all of this and I said, it's, it's not really God. I think I just made it all up. And he said, no, that's how you know it's God. And I'll never forget that conversation from a guy I'll probably never see again. But he said, that's how you know it's God. Dream even bigger, dream even bigger. And I remember it just that God dream coming in my life. And it influenced me in a huge way. And at first I didn't think it was God, but it was because God wants us to do the impossible. A God dream seems impossible. It seemed impossible with David in the Bible. It seemed impossible with Abraham. God told Abraham, your descendants would number the sand of the seashore, the stars of the sky. Abraham never even saw that God dream come to pass in his life. 
Sometimes a God dream doesn't happen in our lifetime, but in his promise, it will happen in your lifeline. When God promises something, it comes to pass. But some of the greatest biblical characters never saw in their lifetime what God promised them while they were living. But it did come to pass, either through them, their children, or their spiritual children. Joseph's dream was so big that the people closest to him, even his own brothers, never even gave it a chance. Have you ever opened up and shared a dream to somebody and they kind of just went, "Eh, that's nice, that's nice. That's honestly, it's just people's role. Very few people are going to jump up and down about something special happening in your life because they want something special to happen in theirs. And we just need to encourage each other to dream bigger, dream bigger. The second thing is your dream will face human opposition. Genesis 37, 8, and then jumping down to 10 through 11, said this. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? You can just sense the sarcasm. And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Verse 10, when he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to you on the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So even his father, the one that favorited him, he starts to get weirded out. And this hatred in his brothers begins to rise and rise and rise and rise. And it turns into a, a hatred that once they want to murder Joseph. The dream isn't starting off too well at all. And I remember um, in my life, and I, I mentioned a few stories last night to the leadership, just about human opposition when it comes to a God dream. I will never forget about 10 or 11 years ago, my dad um, came to our church and our church was extremely uh, traditional, not moving forward. Um, I mean, we, I, I remember having to wear a suit and tie like every single Sunday morning. We sat on the stage in throne chairs. I never understood that, why pastors want to sit in their thrones on stage, but whatever. So we were doing all of that. And, I mean, and we were just not advancing. People weren't getting baptized. People weren't getting saved. And my dad was just like, I'm done. I'm done with church as normal church is normal. Church is this, how we've been doing it for 20 years. And he cast this new vision of guys, we're going to be a church of all ages, of all ages. It's for everybody, but we're going to reach a young generation. We're going to be a church of all ages. That's going to say church is no longer about me because we're losing a young generation of Christians in our country. We're going to go after the young generation. And honestly, my dad was thinking people are going to be like, yeah, and think this is awesome. No, 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 no. Because when you cast a God dream, the people you think are Christians, you'll find out real quick whether or not they're a Pharisee or an actual Christian. Because he's saying, we're going to reach people. And they're like, how dare you reach people? I'm here and I have needs. And they're, and, you know, it's that, but that's always the mark of a Pharisee. Always, 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 always. Because a true disciple looks forward into other people. Pharisees look within about their needs. And so immediately human opposition starts rising up and it comes from Christians. I remember the day my dad hired me to be the youth pastor. My youth pastor was my hero, and he was uh, transitioning out and planting a church in another state, and it was a great transition. Wasn't fired. He was resigning. We spent three or four months where me and him working closely together to take the youth ministry. I, I was up. My dad brought me up on the stage, and there was this, like, ceremony where my old youth pastor actually handed me the keys of the youth ministry, you know, like that whole symbolic thing, and they were going to pray over me. I remember waking up that Sunday morning thinking, This is going to be the best day of my life. I cannot wait. This is the beginning of that dream God gave me. And I go up on the stage thinking that people are going to be clapping and cheering. And most people were. But there was a man in our church and at that time was actually heading up the the senior adults ministry. And we didn't know that the last three or four days since my dad announced to the board that they were hiring me, that he had made all kinds of phone calls to the entire ministry that said when he announces that Dustin is the new youth pastor, we're going to stand up and do a walkout. And sure enough, they did. They all stood up, about 30 of them, and did this with their hands and then walked out because they couldn't see a vision of an older generation saying, I've had my time. I've had my experience with God. I'm still going to experience church, but now I've got to look to the next generation and serve. And we're going to win people. And they couldn't do it. And they left. And I remember what was supposed to be the happiest day of my life ended up being a memory that makes me sick to my stomach. Because immediately starting off ministry, you're insecure. People hate me. Why aren't they understanding? These are Christians. Why don't, they, why don't they want people to get saved? Why don't they want a young generation coming in? Why do they want to have songs that they sang for 40 years? Why can't it be for a new generation? I don't, and I didn't understand as a young man. Because we're a church of all ages. Not just older or younger. All ages. But 
If we lose a young generation, we lose Christianity in our country. That's the bottom line. We have to reach a young generation. We have to. Thanks, five people that were clapping, but we have to. (laughs) But his brothers, his brothers were filled with hatred and they plotted to first to murder him, but ultimately sold him into slavery. And you think about human opposition in the Bible and it's with every great man and woman of God, all of them. David, Noah, Daniel, Mary, the mother of Jesus, being shunned by society, Jesus himself, and us. It, it always astonishes me when someone, a man or woman, wants to do something great for God and they start retreating because they think human opposition is a sign that they made the wrong decision. No, human opposition is always the mark of you doing something God called you to do. It's always there, always there, when you're doing something that God called you to do. Number three, your dream will face circumstantial opposition. And it's different than human opposition. So his brothers are plotting to kill him. And then in Genesis 37, we'll jump right back into the story. Judah, um, which was one of the older brothers, said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother. Every time I read this, I think this is comical. So he's like, let's not kill him. After all, he is our brother. Let's just sell him into slavery. After all, he is our brother. I'm like, guys, you can't say after all, he is our brother when the better option is selling him into slavery. Anyway, so so he's like, after all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brother's like, I agree. Let's be nice. Sell him into slavery. Um, 28. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the well, sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Now, I I say circumstantial opposition because Joseph has no control over these circumstances that are happening to him. And in our lives, on the way to pursuing the call of God, the dream that we have as individuals or corporately as a church, there's going to be circumstantial opposition as well. I mean, Ronnie and I were just talking like even last week with a time change. We had one third of our church not show up because of a time change. I'm like, for the love of God, it's an hour, people. You know, that kind of thing. Like, but just circumstantial opposition is in our personal lives as well. You know, I mean, there's financial stuff. A refrigerator goes out. Something happens. You forget to pay a bill. You turn the lights on. They don't come on. You're like, no. You know, all of those circumstantial opposition things happen. There's sickness. There's very serious things that happen that are out of our control. And circumstantial opposition comes. Sometimes it's an intentional attack from the enemy on us. And sometimes it's just the fact that we live in a lost and broken world. It's just a fact that we live in a sin-cursed world and things happen. But this is what I love. This is what I love about circumstantial opposition. That God in his power and in his majesty will take this brokenness that we have within us, take the brokenness that we experience in the world And he will work those different pieces of brokenness together to create wholeness in our lives. And he does it all the time. So what happens is so many people see circumstantial opposition as something that is evil and we begin to run from it when God's wanting us to endure it. We have to, have to, have to endure it. Joseph in this story, it's a major, major, major part of his story that he had to go through these ups and downs. He had to. In order for him to get where God wanted him to go, he had to experience the ups and he had to experience the downs. He went into Potiphar's house and his wife accuses him of things and accuses him of of coming on to her and he gets thrown into prison. Then he's in prison and the baker and the cupbearer come and he interprets a dream and then it's up and then it's down because after interpreting that dream, he was in prison for two more years. I think sometimes when we look at these Bible stories, we'll see something like two years and go, oh, that's not bad. Well, like what if you were sentenced to prison for two years? That's not not that bad. That's awful. Two years after Joseph interprets the dream correctly, we read the Bible and think the cup and bearer and baker went upstairs and told Pharaoh and then Joseph's just walking out. Two years after his obedience to God was how long he was in that prison. And that ties directly into number four, which is your dream will grow you. Your dream will grow you. It will grow you. It will mold you. It'll make you think bigger and it will teach you to see things from a higher perspective. I um, am from Albuquerque and we live really close to the mountains and um, I love hiking. Anybody like hiking? I mean, I know you guys have a Paladuro Canyon and stuff here too. That's that's pretty cool. But I love hiking. 
And I hiked in the foothills. I have hiked those foothills so many times in Albuquerque. And I'll wander off the trails and I never get lost. But there was this one dumb Saturday morning where I was hiking and I had my dog with me and we went off the trail and he heard a noise and started running. So then I'm running after him. And it's like three or four in the afternoon at this point. And all of a sudden, I finally find him and turn around. And I have no, we're in one of those little canyons. And I have no idea where we are. And you know that time in the afternoon where dusk is starting to come, you know, and you're below the tree line. You can't see anything. And you can kind of feel the, the temperature dropping. You know that time of day. Normally, you're like, this is beautiful. But when you're lost in the woods and the mountains, that's not a beautiful time of day. You're like, I'm about to die, you know. But it's like 75 degrees. It was the summer, you know. But like, I'm like, in my mind, I'm like hyperventilating. Going, I'm going to freeze to death. I have to build a shelter. I've got to do all these things, like naked and afraid, you know, all this kind of, I'm like freaking out, you know. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm lost below the tree line, can't see anything. But here's the deal. If you're hiking in the mountains and you get lost, Never, we, we know this almost innately. You don't have to be taught. You never go deeper into the woods. You immediately look for higher ground. You immediately look for a rock. You immediately look for a boulder or a hill where you can get up to see above the tree line and get the higher perspective to see where you need to go. What a God dream does, if we fully commit to it, is it pulls us above the tree line, the weeds of life, to where we get lost and we are fearful and all of the anxiety and the things that control our life is below the tree line. But when we pursue a God dream with everything on us, eventually we'll find the higher ground and it gives us a different perspective on life. We can see where we've been and we can see where we need to go. But a God dream will grow you if you'll allow it to grow you, but we have to be willing to go through it. We have to be willing to go through it. Every little thing Joseph went through, good and bad, was growing him and molding him to become the man that God needed him to be to save an entire nation of Jewish people everything. Joseph was a spoiled little brat who loved being the favorite. And God was like, I want to use that, but I can't. He's going to have to go through a process to where I can grow him and mold him so he can carry the weight of saving a nation. And here's what's interesting. And I read this the other day and it's massive. Not only was Joseph carrying the weight to save a nation, but he was carrying the weight of saving the bloodline of Christ, which was through one of his brothers, that if they died of starvation in the famine, the bloodline of Christ would be ended. Joseph was carrying our salvation, and he never even knew it. And he never even knew it. It's a matter of perspective. And sometimes we're in those moments and we think it's not fair, it's not fair. We, we say that as adults, but here, if you're a parent, Anytime your kid says, can I have that because so-and-so, brother or sister, and they go, it's not fair. What do we say as parents immediately? Life's not fair, right? Something happens to us. What do we do immediately as grown adults to God? It's not fair. I think a lot of times if you're a parent, when you really look at your relationship with God, you, you can really laugh at yourself because we want God to treat us differently than how we're trying to train our kids. They come to us like, it's not fair. And you're like, Life's not fair, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And we go to God and like, it's not fair. And we want God to be like, you're right. And like pull us out of every little bit of trouble. But sometimes he's looking at us and saying, the point to living isn't fairness, it's wholeness. It's growing you into who you need to be. It's growing you into what I need you to become so you can carry the calling that I have in your life. Everybody wants a big purpose from God, everybody. But few people want to be disciplined and molded into the people God needs them to be. Romans 8, 28, I, I love this, one of my favorite verses ever. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For the, for the longest time, I read this passage as almost like there's a little bit of good in everything. You know, God will always work it out for the good. Just find the good in every situation. Guys, that's not what it's trying to say. Sometimes situations are just bad and there's no good. God doesn't teach us in the Bible to find the good in every situation. What he does say is, you live in a sin-cursed world, but the hope of Jesus Christ one day ultimately is heaven. But now you can know one thing, that even the most evil, even the, mo the biggest disappointments, the biggest things that happen in life that are just bad, ultimately have to bow down to me and I am good. I didn't cause it. 
I didn't cause that evil. I didn't cause that tragedy. But since I am God and almighty over it all, if you'll trust me and keep moving, I will force that bad situation to bow down to my goodness. And I will work that bad into the good, Romans 8, 28. And you will experience wholeness at a level you have never experienced if you will keep walking and trust the good and loving God. Romans 8, 28 is saying everything ultimately submits to God. And if we trust him, we will experience his goodness and one day look over our shoulders and we may not know why it happened, but we will see the goodness of God the whole way through our entire lives. Joseph had the luxury of looking back at the end of his story and seeing why. But there were a lot of biblical characters who never did. In heaven, they saw why. But on earth, we're not guaranteed to ever know why. We're only guaranteed to know and see the goodness of God. Over and over again in the story, you see these little scriptures tucked away when Joseph is in the prison, when he's in the well, when he's in these horrible situations, you see these little bitty bits of scripture that just says things like, and God was with him. And God was with him. And he wasn't alone. And God was with him. And you, it just, all the way through the story. But God never spoke, it never says God spoke to him. It just says he interpreted the dream. But God was with him. God never had, had, never had this encounter in prison where God showed up or an angel of the Lord showed up with him. Joseph wasn't standing there in the narrator writing the story going, and God was with him. And God is with him. Joseph didn't have that luxury. He's just like us. He's human. But God was with him. And later on, he saw that he was. And I'll say that to you. No matter what you're going through, God may not have caused it, but he's with you. And he's good. And if we keep moving, he will mold it into good for your life. The word discipline in the Bible, and we think of the word discipline again with parenting, we're like, that's not really a good word. Discipline is the same root word as disciple. So when you look at discipline in the Bible, instead of saying it as discipline, look at it as discipling. And when in the, in the New Testament, when the Hebrew word, when it talks about discipline, old and new, the Hebrew word is paideia, or Greek word is paideia. And what God is teaching us here through discipline is that, again, you can't look at discipline as punishment because we'll look at God as causing these things. Discipline is after the thing happens, whether God caused it or not, God will take us through his loving discipline. He is a loving father. Loving fathers discipline their children. And we see the result when kids aren't disciplined. You're like, that kid doesn't get spankings. You know, that kind of thing. You know, we see the results, right? A loving father disciplines his children. But in the Bible, it's not punishment. It's molding. It's shaping. A loving father. In this story, honestly, Jacob, at this point in the story, was not a good dad. Good dads do not have ultimate favoritism toward one son. Good dads are willing to hear the voice of God and invest in each kid, try to invest in each kid as much as they can, equally and loving and trying to do as much as they can. In this situation, I mean, he's married to Rachel and the Leah stuff and takes two handmaids. I mean, Jacob's not like the epitome of godliness up in this point in this story. But here's what's awesome. It doesn't matter what your earthly father's like or, or mother is like or the situation. There is a heavenly father behind the father that is still molding and pushing the story for, further. So it doesn't matter what mistakes Jacob made as a father, the father is right behind him, molding and shaping and pushing. There's always a heavenly father behind the earthly father who is better than any earthly father could have been. It always blows my mind, like I mentioned earlier, how many Christians want to run from pain rather than looking at it and saying, could this somehow, it doesn't make sense in my human mind, but on the other side of this pain, could there be blessing? And if we could ever be disciplined enough to look at pain, and although as much as it hurts to not run from it, but to endure it, on the other side of it is blessing, is fulfillment, is joy. Because God takes the brokenness of the world, molds it with the brokenness in you, with his holiness, and brings about blessing. That's the promise we have from God. Number five, your dream needs you to dream again. Your dream needs you to dream again. Are you guys with me today? Is this helping anybody? Your dream needs you to dream again. Because here's what happens as Christians. Sometimes we will settle in. We'll settle in and go, ah, I, know, I, I know God called me to do this at some point, but I just have to be realistic now. Guys, that is borderline sinning if it's not an all-out sin. To become realistic in the, in the face of, of a God that does the impossible. God, I'm gonna be realistic about this. I, you know, life is just different than it used to be. I need to be realistic. Look in the New Testament. No apostle, no disciple, no Christian had the luxury ever of saying, I wanna live a realistic life. 
It was all or nothing. At the end of your life, do you want to look back and say, I lived a realistic life? Or do you want to say, I lived an idealistic life? That I always wanted to live by the God idea. Not my ideas, not something that seems attainable. What do you, what do you want? Toward the end of my life, I want to look back and think, I gave, ev- I gave it everything I had. I put it all out there. God spoke to me something, and whether it came to pass or not, that's up to him. But I gave it everything I had because that's all God asked us to do. You do what's possible, I'll do what's impossible. But are you actually doing everything that's possible in your hands? Are you living a fully devoted life to Jesus? Do you understand fully, if you're a Christian, what church is supposed to look like? Do we really understand? Because it's become a cool little catchphrase that we don't go to church, we are the church. But do we really understand that we are the church? When you look at the story of Joseph, the story needed Joseph to dream again. And Joseph begins in interpreting the dream to Pharaoh, gets elevated and really quickly elevated. And all of a sudden, this famine, everything he predicted happened. The famine, all this stuff hits the land. And sure enough, his brothers have to come to Egypt to ask for food because they're about to die of starvation. And they send, a, you know, big long story, but ultimately they end up bowing down to Joseph. And through all of this season of Joseph's growth, you can tell that all of the ups and downs were necessary because Joseph as that little punk middle school kid would have looked at his brothers and said, starve. You did all of this to me. This is sweet revenge. But mature Joseph, who had been disciplined by the loving hand of God, told his brothers to stand up and gave them what they needed and had full mercy on his brothers. Because that's what the maturity of God looks like. Someone who is living in their purpose gives mercy when others wouldn't. We, we see situations in our lives and, and we want to get revenge. And I, I, I mean, we, we're human. I want revenge. But the sign of maturity is releasing revenge and giving mercy. Release it and give mercy. When we look at the story, the big picture, God is under and behind everything in Joseph's life. All of it. He was there the entire time. Most of my life, to be honest with you, I... I Growing up and when I first started youth pastoring, I would meet with kids that were going through tragedy and, and stuff and teenagers and they would look at me and go, well, it seems like you have a pretty cookie cutter life and both parents love each other and, and you know, great marriage, live in a godly home. And honestly, I have. I lived a pretty cookie cutter life. Not that much tragedy, not that much going on. Everything was just kind of like, cool, you know, very by the book, Christian family kind of thing. And then it was like, I, I love God because God just throws curveballs all the time. Then a curveball comes. I have this idea of what marriage is going to look like, when I'm going to get married. I go to Bible college. If you go to Bible college and you're halfway normal, you get married when you graduate, right? Like it, that's what's supposed to happen. Not me. You know, I had this very cookie cutter idea of what life was supposed to look like. And this idea that God is behind and under everything, I actually had to live it. For the first time in my whole life, I had to live it in my 20s because I wanted so bad. I was a full-time pastor. I wanted a companion, not just a wife, I wanted my companion to do ministry with. I was lonely. You know, I'm, I was 27 years old and, and living with roommates and stuff. And you kind of start wondering, I know it's not old, but you kind of start wondering like, what, you know, what's, what's going to happen here? You know, is this, is this ever going to happen? And I thought I was supposed to get married in Bible college. You know, like, did I have some weird like black mark on my head or something? Like what happened, you know? And then I, what I didn't know, one day I was, I was in a relationship, a three and a half year relationship and I knew in my heart, great girl, not it. And I knew that it was coming to an end. And one day I walked into church and my parents were out of town and I was preaching that weekend. And there's this lady, she actually just passed away a few um, weeks ago named Ruthie Smith in our church. She's the longest running uh, member of our church. Her husband was on staff at our church in the fifties. And I walked into the foyer and she was always sitting there and I would walk by every Sunday morning and say, hey, Sister Smith, how are you? And she would say, hey, Dustin. And I walked by that day and she was crying, sitting there. She was there, always there early because she had been dropped off. And I walked in. And she was crying. And she said, Dustin, is that you? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I was like, you know, when Ruthie Smith says your name, you just, yes, ma'am, you know. And I, I walked up to her and she said, I need to talk to you right now. I said, okay, okay. And she pulled me off to the side and she said, God woke me up in the middle of the night last night to tell you something. And I, all this stuff, and I was literally battling. I don't want to end another relationship. I don't want to start over. Should I just propose to this girl because it feels like I should? And this Little old lady said, God woke me up in the middle of the night to tell you, you're in the wrong relationship. 
and God has your future wife, but there's something going on in her life that he's working out and he needs you to be still, be still. And then she just sits down. And I was like, it was like that conversation never happened. And I went upstairs and I just started weeping. I had no idea that me being in New Mexico, all the way in Alabama, that my future wife, I'm gonna try not to cry, was going through a horrific divorce. Her ex-husband was, or her husband was leaving her and her three kids. They were worship pastors together. He was leaving them and abandoning them, moving, walking away into a different lifestyle completely. She was having the worst season of her entire life, thinking some of the same things I was, okay, I can do this. I'm going to be a single mom the rest of my life. She said, I'd resign to that, and that's fine. I can do that. God is enough, and she still believes that to this day. God is enough for single moms. God is enough for single dads, and it's the truth. But she was going through the most horrific time in her life, and this little old lady listened to the voice of God, and, and she said, be still. And what I didn't know, and this story proves, and we've seen it in our lives, God is always behind the scenes. He's under and behind everything, taking the brokenness and saying, just keep moving, just keep moving. And he's weaving that brokenness together. And one day a church calls from Alabama and says, can you come help us with youth ministry stuff? And we were on vacation down there. So I said, sure. And I met up with them. In comes the five staff members. And one of them was my wife. And I got to adopt the three older kids a couple years ago. And some of you know that story, but it always reminds me of the goodness of God. It always reminds me that when I'm looking at my God dream and my purpose, when it seems like there's no way forward and it's not gonna happen and there's, it's impossible and why would I ever dream a dream that big? That story reminds me he's under and behind everything. Just you do what's possible. Let him do what's impossible. Let him do what's impossible. What's your God dream? We need to dream again. One of my favorite passages in the entire Bible is Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God is an exceedingly abundant God. Not a God of just enough. A God of exceeding abundance. But do you believe that? About your specific purpose. So the next time you're facing a seemingly impossible situation, all you got to do is just stand there and say, I've, I've been here before. It's seemingly impossible, but it's not. And just like we have individual dreams, churches have dreams. Churches have visions. Churches have purposes. And guys, I mentioned this to the leadership last night. There are very few human beings on this planet that I believe more in than my uncle Ronnie. And this church, every time I come here, I love the name because it's a family. It's a family. There is something about this church that can move and shake a city. But you have to believe it. You've got to believe it and look at a dream and say, it is so much more than just attendance. It is so much more than coming just because I always have. It's so much more than coming and looking for my opportunities in church. It's looking for opportunities to serve people, looking for opportunities to reach people, looking at the Bible, what the local church is supposed to be. It is this, it's life-giving, and it's so much more. We're on a journey with our church and going back to the New Testament and saying, what is church supposed to be? In the New Testament, they faced a society just like ours, where we would look at it and say, ah, it's impossible, it's too far gone. And Paul just walks into Rome and it's changed. This walks into Ephesus and the church starts spreading. How, why? It was a belief that it's so much more than just a box you check. It's so much more than just showing up and leaving and going to lunch. It's being a part of the hope of the world, not a hope of the world, the hope of the world. And when a group of people this size believes that cities, regions, and countries are changed. It's time to dream again. It's time to dream again. If you guys would bow your heads and close your eyes, I wanna pray over you today. I wanna just pray blessing over your church and you as individuals, and and I'll I'll turn it over to, to Ronnie in a second, but what an amazing church you're a part of. Father, we thank you so much for today. God, I pray that that this word would not be mine. God, this is straight from your word, straight from the story of Joseph. God, this dream. God, I pray that right now as individuals, maybe we've given up on dreams. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would just begin to, to pour dreams, allow people to dream again. It doesn't matter what age they are, Father, young, old, it doesn't matter. 
who has situations going on and lives, God, and right now is the time to dream again. We open up our hearts. We open up our minds. God, just begin to flood today and this week and tomorrow, the next few days, God, just as we're driving around, begin to flood new dreams and our individual purposes, God, but also to give insight and wisdom about how all of those individual purposes and giftings and dreams come together as family worship center, the church, God, and as, as they come together, we form one dream the hope of the world to reach the lost, to grow, to reach people, to make disciples that would go all over this city, region, and the world, Father. I pray blessing over this church. I pray that there would be a multiplication of, of disciples that are sent out, missionaries that are sent out, Father, that this would be a hub for an entire region of people's lives being changed, ministers being developed. God, I pray for Ronnie and Shannon that you would give them supernatural wisdom, direction over this church, God, I pray that these next few years, the next five to seven years would be the greatest years that this church has ever seen. God, that people, lives would be changed, that people would be coming in and pouring in and they don't even know why, but they are drawn because hope is found here. Dreams are found here because your name is lifted up. You said that if we lift up your name, you would draw people unto you. And that's what this church is, a beacon to this city. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.